Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for another episode of the show. Um, so let's let's kind of talk about the past couple weeks real quick. Um, two amazing interviews. Okay, I'm going to assume that Gary's interview was amazing because I'm recording this the same day as the Skype tasting with Sam Scapari of Seraphim Wine. Amazing, amazing guy. He wore the Longhorn hat. He's a Jets fan, by the way. So that's cool with me. I forgot to tell him that I'm, I like the Jets, like all the New Jersey, New York teams. Though I'm a Vikings fan, and uh, we talked about football after the after the after the show, we talked to, we talked sports and and some other stuff. So it was great. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to go back and check out the interview with Sam, go do it. It was an hour and a half long. Um, I just actually recorded a little intro to that. Um, so uh, go check it out. Uh, fabulous. Probably. I mean, not that I haven't had any fun with any of the other Skype interviews I've done, but. Definitely some of the, uh, one of the more fun, uh, and it wasn't like we did look, look crazy, but you know, as, as they would say, well, definitely in England, I'm not sure about Australia, even Australia, they say a couple of blokes drink some wine, just bull, you know, BSing, okay? It's pretty much what it was, and that was, that was kind of the cool thing. Um, really enjoyed it. All right, so let's, uh, let's go on with, uh, let's do some reviews. We haven't done review in a couple weeks, um, two or three weeks, especially with Gary's interview. Um, which, um, again, I'm recording this before Gary's interview, but I'm telling you, I bet it was epic. I bet you it was epic. So if you haven't seen it, go back and see it. All right, so what we're going to review here. Uh, we've got, um, let's just go right into this wine here. Okay. Those of you that have been watching the show for a little while, not, not, you don't have to be an old school person, know that I've already reviewed one wine from this label. I bought three wines, so I finally decided I was going to review the next wine from the label. Okay, uh, we're going to review the non-vintage cul-de-sac uh, Merlot. Uh, bought this at HEB for $2.99, I believe. I'd have to actually look up the price uh, from the Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, it is an American wine. All right, so let's briefly go over that real quick. Uh, the appellation on the bottle is American. That means the grapes could come from everywhere, anywhere in the United States. They could have grown the grapes in Minnesota. They could have grown some grapes in Florida. They could have grown some grapes in Wisconsin, Idaho, Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, wherever. These grapes can come from anywhere. Since, not, since at least 75% of the grapes did not come from one state, that is my feeling is that they, they just kind of source these grapes from wherever. All right, uh, $2.99 bought it at HEB Central Market, but they, it's available pretty much at every HEB. Uh, my feeling is this is uh, HEB's quote answer to Charles Shaw from Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's is starting to make inroads into Texas. Uh, they already have, they've already had a store in Austin for a while. Um, I think they're opening a store, have, or have opened a store in the Dallas area. They're going to open one here in San Antonio area within the next month or so. It's supposed to open up next month, but they're delaying a few weeks. So I think it's November that they're going to open up. And uh, one of their big claims to fame with wine was Charles Shaw. So the two, three, or four buck Chuck um, wine. And this apparently is their answer. Uh, somebody else was having somebody else is another grocery store chain is has inexpensive wine uh, on the shelves too to help supposedly combat Trader Joe's. Anyway, um, that's all I know about it. I just know um, that the the company um, vented and bottled by Cul-de-Sac Winery, Livermore in Rip Ripon, California. And that's 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 real dude. Seriously, that's all there is to know about this wine. There is nothing. Okay, at least 
at least the last time I reviewed it. I haven't gone back out on the internet to see if there's actually a website for it, but I guarantee you there's not. All right, so let's get into the wine here. Um, color, um, kind of see-through, not too bad for Merlot. Merlot is not gonna be a heavy wine. It's not, shouldn't be opaque. You should be able to kind of see through it. Um, it's maybe a little lighter or see-through than maybe I would expect from a Merlot, but it is not, uh, it's not like it's, um, it's not like it's bad or anything. Okay. All right, off the nose, um, I get a very chemical type of processed fruit smell, uh, like hard candy type of smell. Just a generic red fruit. Um, when I get this smell, a lot of times I think of candied raspberry, you know, raspberry candy, hard, hard shell candy. Um, you know, actually what reminds me of is there's that red and white striped barrel shaped candy that's like a raspberry, cherry, some type of red fruit thing. And you, you, it's, it's the smell of that candy. It's like that shiny, it's like I said, so it's hard candy. That's, that's the type of candy I get out of that. I get that out of other wines too, so more expensive wines I get it out of, so it's not, not a knock on the wine. Floral, I don't really get much floral out of it, and minerality. There might be, there's a bit of, you know, honestly there's a bit of maybe some white pepper to it. There, there is a little bit, and I don't know if he's trying to stretch on that, but the, the, the processed hard candy smell is starting to go away, so it's starting to blow off. If I really like the, the wine a couple weeks ago where I was getting that sulfur, the stink bomb smell, and I really just let it air out a little bit and just swirl the, you know, you know what out of the wine. But I do get kind of that kind of a pepper, that, that a, more of a white pepper than, than a black pepper, but get a little bit of that and, and that, that processed hard candy smell is now starting to go away. So it's more of just like a, a red fruit, more, I would say more, more cherry than raspberry, maybe even a little strawberry, but, but there's some fruit in there now, but it smells more like regular fruit, but it's very faint. I'm getting some some fruit flavors to it again. Some some red red fruit, bright red fruit, um, but I also get kind of that hard candy type of flavoring to it. It feels a little it feels a little hot on the alcohol. I guarantee you, it's not. It's only twelve and a half percent, but I kind of get a little bit of that alcohol on there, so it doesn't feel like the alcohol's like well contained, but it's nothing. It's nothing dramatic. It's not like you're going, oh my goodness, I got a bunch of alcohol. It's just I can kind of feel a little bit of alcohol on it. Um, I also did seem to get some vegetals, a little, little herbal out of it. And dare I say some pepper, as in like, Green pepper, jalapeno pepper type of stuff. They may have introduced a little bit of Cab Franc into it, or maybe even there's some Cabernet Sauvignon um, and getting those peppers. Or maybe a Petite Syrah, but there might be, it's probably not it might be 100% Merlot, but my thinking is it's mostly Merlot and they, they added a few percentage points of something else to maybe give it a little bit more oomph, a little bit more body to it. I have to say, I, I, from what I remember of the, of the Cabernet Sauvignon, I like this better. It's not, it's not a wine I'm going to sit there and go, 
oh my goodness, I can't believe I spent $3 for it. That's, that's how I felt about the Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, it's not bad. It's a $3 bottle of wine. You're not going to expect the world out of it. Um, is it a 90 point wine? Not by a long shot. Um, but if you're looking for a wine that's $3, that's drinkable, that you can pop and pour, um, that you can have for an everyday drinking wine, you're, you're gonna have some dinner, um, you're gonna have some dinner, you're gonna, and you wanna have some wine to, to drink, it's not a bad buy. Now, what kind of rating am I going to give it? I give it, I give it an eighty-one. I give it more than just an eighty. I, I think you know it's, it's, it. I don't find that there's really any faults to the wine, um, other than maybe I kind of notice that alcohol a little bit early. But even then, like right now. I'm trying to breathe out to see if there's any alcohol. I don't really get any alcohol burn, so it might have been just an initial thing that I kind of got the alcohol, but now I don't. Um, I find it is really thin. There's there's not that much body to this Merlot. Like I said, they maybe added something in it to give on the flavor profile to give a little bit of kick to it, like that little bit of spiciness, a little that that hint of pepper. But there's effectively no finish. It's it's it's, it's a very very short finish. Um, it's thin, it's nothing great, um, I, but I, I think it's at least in an 80 point range. It, it, I, think it's, I think it deserves at least an 80 on it rather than below 80, because when you get below 80, it's just now you're starting to talk about poorly made wine, um, not just whether you like it or not. I mean, would I buy it again? I don't know. I like Merlot. I tend to like that, that grape a little bit better. It's not, it's not a disaster. Um, but it's also a $3 bottle of wine. So if you see it in your HEB or whatever store, if, you, if, if you're in Texas somewhere and you got it, you can buy it and it's, it's pleasant, but it, it, it kind of disappears. And it's not even like that wine we had two weeks ago that the, uh, the Columbia Crest, right? Where, where I said it kind of disappeared. That at least lasted a little longer than this one. This one's like, it's like you get a, a, a brief little taste and it's done. Like I said, if you can find it, and uh, if you can find it, and you want something that's really inexpensive, buy it. It's not not uh, it's not going to kill you to buy it. Okay, so um, we're going to move on to the next wine in just a second. Um, since uh, I have a lot of people that watch on TiVo, so as far as I know, you don't see the blip.tv ads. I, I I need to just stop saying those things because I think I think we've got the point that you don't see the ads. All right, so um, we'll talk about the book real quick. I still haven't finished it. I promise I will finish it this week. Well, this week I'm recording it. So by the time you see this, I should have already had this finished and started on the next book that I really, really need. There's a couple books I really need to read, which is a Bordeaux book, and there's another book by Oz Clark. It's all about great varietals, and that's the book I probably should start next. But anyway, Matt Kramer's understanding, or make, sorry, Making Sense of Italian Wine, um, you can get it off of Amazon. Stop by the website. I've got a link below that takes you to the Amazon store to buy it. Um, like I said, it's 25 bucks on the uh, listed in the label. I still haven't looked to see what it is uh, at Amazon, but I will look that up right now because you know why? Because I got a link for it on the website. Wines and if you haven't seen the wines and wasps don't mix episode, you need to go. You need to go see it. Uh, that one was a lot of fun to make. I hope to go back down to Rockport soon, actually, just to relax a little bit and do that. Uh, it's $24.95. So $24.95, you get it at Amazon. Click the link below. Let's go on to the next wine. Okay, now we're back. Uh, we're back with the next wine. So um, I bought this wine initially to uh, be part of a restaurant series of wines that I had done. Um, and what happened was I bought the wrong one. We have, um, or we had this wine, but the Russian River Valley instead of the one we have here. So um, I never ended up doing it part of the restaurant series of wines, but um, I decided it, it's, I've had it long enough. You know, let's just go ahead and just get it done because I've been really wanting to try this wine. All right, so here we have the 2009 Sonoma Couture Sonoma Coast Chardonnay. Okay, bought it for 18, bought it at Specs for $18.59. 
Um, now, Sonoma Couture makes quite a few wines. Um, they, and, and as far as I know, they're all Chardonnays, okay, from different areas. Um, I was going through their little history. And uh, what happened was they started as a vineyard company in 73. So basically they just grew grapes and they sold them off to people to make wines. Well, the quality of their wine was becoming very well known. So um, uh, they decided in 1981, yes, 1981, they broke ground for a winery and then they went into business, you know, to be a winery instead of just selling off their fruit. Now they have, uh, like I said, they have several wines. Um, They've got, uh, let's see, wines. Here we go. They've got, well, no, they have, oh, they have more than just Chardonnay. Uh, but they've got, uh, so they've got Pinot Noir and let's see what else. Looks like it's mostly Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Okay. So, um, but it, it's, it's one of those brands that you see quite a bit in the stores. Um, you will find it on restaurant wine lists. So it's widely distributed. So it shouldn't be too hard to find. So let's go and take a look at it. Now I did rinse out the wine, the glass with some water instead of like this wine and then dumping it. So um, if you look at it, it's got a, a deep golden color. So, you know, kind of that somewhat st stereotypical Chardonnay from California, golden, golden color to it. I mean, it, it almost matches, it almost matches the, the foil, okay? So um, very, very deep golden color, you know, clear, bright. Um, it's clear, but it does look like it has a little bit of crystals in it. Now, it also could be, you know, I've had a bunch of wine in here, and it might be just stuff, but it looks like it's got a little bit of crystallization, um, which isn't bad. It's not a bad part, but um, it looks like it's got that in there. Let's swirl it a little bit and see if those little particles are still there. Again, not bad, um, but then I've used this wine glass a lot, so... It could just be residue from other wines in here, okay? Uh, with that also said, about far looking at legs and viscosity, you know, it's kind of hard to tell. But um, deep, deep golden color. So let's go and check it out. All right, right off the bat, I, I, you know, um, I get that apple type of that golden apple, because probably thinking gold, you know, the color, but that apple type of aroma off of it, which um, I'm kind of surprised a little bit by that. And we'll, we'll go, we'll go to that a little bit. I'm kind of surprised I'm getting such, such a deep, uh, at least at first, an apple type of aroma. But I also get kind of a peach or tangerine type of aroma too. Kind of that fuzzy fruit, okay? And a bit of floral, uh, probably a white flower type of thing. I can't be more specific than that, but as, you, as we should know by now, flowers and I don't really get along or I don't tend to pick up on specific flowers. I just kind of get generalized generalizations with flowers. Kind of sometimes with people with fruit, they, they can just go, well, I get some type of color of fruit, but not like a specific fruit. Other than that, you know, I don't really get any type of butter or oakiness off of the off of the uh, wine, at least off the bouquet. But yeah, I get kind of a, actually more of a cantaloupe rather than the peach and nectarine, but that, that's in there too. But I get in some of, some of it kind of the fleshy part of, of the, uh, of the fruit. And really the apple part is, is kind of blown off. I, I'm not really getting that as much anymore. All right. Okay, off the off the palate, um, there's a bit of creaminess to it, uh, a decent amount of acid. Uh, it's it's not focused; it's more like on the sides of the tongue instead of right down the center. But um, 
a decent amount of a hint of creaminess, but I do get some of the same type of fruits. Um, I kind of get that cantaloupe type of thing. I kind of, you know, I get the, not only the apple, but maybe more of a baked apple type of thing. A little bit of spice. Maybe caramelized type of type of fruit. Um, very pleasant, even at room temperature. Very pleasant drinking wine. It's not an over-the-top buttered popcorn, you know, uh, uh, California-style Chardonnay. Um, it's got a good balance of that bit of creaminess to it, but having decent acidity and having some decent fruit. I think it's a pretty darn good Chardonnay. We know that I don't do a lot of Chardonnays because I tend to find some Chardonnays, many Chardonnays, not really being inspirational, kind of being like, eh, you know, whatever. But this is pretty decent. Um, it's $19. I think it's fairly priced, I think, for, for what the kind of Chardonnay it is. I think it's better than what you're going to get from a $10 Chardonnay. Um, I think it's right around that $20 level as far as what's going to be out there. Um, I, I do like it. I like it a decent amount. I, I give it a, I think I give it a solid, um, I think I give it a solid 88. Um, you know, really it's pretty decent. Um, this is something that I could totally enjoy um, as a wine. So let's talk about the wine just a little bit. Um, the reason why I was a little bit surprised when I got the, the apple aroma at first. Um, first of all, they, uh, they hand harvest these grapes. Uh, they say they hand harvest it in the dark of the early mornings in shallow bins to prevent crushing the clusters. So the reason they do that, I mean, see, it should be obvious, right? But if you have these really deep bins, gravity starts to crush the grapes a little bit and the juice starts to leak out. And literally fermentation could start at that point, but probably not. But you're, you're, you're getting this juice into these bins when they really want to get them into the press, okay? So you want to have the least amount of... of um, damage to the grapes as possible. Um, I say they're cooled down to 40 degrees to preserve the fresh fruits, the, fr the fruits, fresh flavors and natural acidity, which we, we got some of that acid. Um, again, it wasn't razor sharp down the middle. It was more on the sides of the tongue, but it was there. Um, and they hand sort it, blah, blah, blah. Um, not going to go through too much of it, but uh, they, it's hundred percent barrel fermented and aged Six to eight months, Sir Lee and French oak harvested from the Vosage and Allier forest. Now, if you remember, we talked about um, oak barrels a, a while ago now, I guess, on the show. Uh, we talked about there's, there's uh, five different forests in, in France, and each of those forests will have certain characteristics. I don't know the characteristics between the forests, but they'll each have kind of a certain characteristic of it. Um, the creaminess that you're getting is from the surly, like it, it's resting on the lees, the, the dead yeast cells. Um, they, uh, they said the barrels are 20% new oak and the remaining are a combination of one year and neutral oak. Neutral oak just means that the barrels are two, three, or usually like at least three years or older, okay? Because as they, they're used more often, uh, they, they have less of an impact on the wine. Um, now, 90% of the wine undergoes malolactic fermentation to add a little creaminess prior to blending. Again, again, that's part of the creaminess from the malolactic fermentation. Malolactic is mallow, was is malic acid is the apples, okay? Lactic acid is the creaminess or, you know, milk, you know, lactose. Um, the surly and the combination of malolactic fermentation gives you a little bit of creaminess. So... But 90, only 90% does this. That 10%, that's where the apple came from, okay? But I was just surprised to, to get it. Um, but it was it was only really at the beginning and then not so much. But then we got that baked apple, okay? Not quite apple pie, but more like a baked apple. A, cob a cobbler type of thing, you know? This is a decent wine. I totally got to stop scratching the nose all the time. I know it's distracting. Um, it's a decent wine. I really like it. I would totally uh, recommend buying it. All right. So uh, real quick, before we go on to the next segment, camera. 
So uh, we talked about this in the So You Want to Be a Podcaster uh, thing. This is the camera I bought when I went to France. It's the Canon uh, PowerShot SX230HS. Um, this has a 14 times optical zoom. Um, there's a link below on the website for you to go to Amazon to buy it. But um, you'll find that there's a, it'll say there's a newer model of this item. It's the SX260 um, and it's got a 20 times, 20 times zoom on it. Um, this particular camera you can get for now 220. Originally it was $300. I think I paid less than that. I think I paid like 275 or something like that when I bought this one. But I highly recommend this camera. If you've ever gone to my Flickr feed, which is Flickr slash I think Leet Wine, L E E T Wine, um, because Yahoo doesn't let you have names that begin with a number. Um, you'll see some of the pictures I've taken with this thing. Uh, well, well, all the France pictures were taken with this. So you go to Flickr, uh, check, take a look at all the pictures. And even then, I don't think I had it set to the full setting on it. And then I've taken some other pictures, Spurs games, which I don't think I have on my Flickr page on, on Leet Wine. But uh, Spurs games, I, I've gone to dinner at the Tower of America, took some great pictures of that. My, uh, my, my background on my phone right now is that. So highly recommend it. All right, so um, let's, and again, hit the website, hit the link below. You can check it out. And uh, maybe I'll put a link for the newer item too, so you can get the upgrade. Anyway, and that's only 253 on Amazon. All right, let's move on to the next wine. All right, we're back, and not with another wine. I don't know why I said that, but we're now for Wine 101. So what's Wine 101 today? We're going to go talk about Chianti versus Super Tuscan, okay? So first of all, how, why did I come up with doing this one? Well, I was at my favorite wine bar, which I think everybody knows by now. It's Max's Wine Dive uh, down in the quarry. I'll have a link to them down below. Um, and uh, I, I go in there quite often, and many times I go in there, I'll ask the bartender to pour me some wines blind so I can work on blind tasting. So um, uh, the idea is that they give me a wine that fits the grid for the Court of Master Sommeliers. Uh, hopefully I've watched this part of the video and I got a little picture of the grid uh, over here, but we'll see. Um, anyway, um, so... Uh, this grid is, is kind of a way to do deductive tasting, okay? So it goes through, you know, what, what fruits, you know, well, F-E-W, fruit, floral, earth, wood. Um, so you, what do you get out of that on the nose, on the palate, you know, your tannins, your acids, uh, alcohol, um, uh, all, those, all those descriptors. And then it starts, you start narrowing that down into um, uh, what you think the wine is as far as varietal, uh, country, vintage, etc. Okay, so they gave me a wine, and I was getting cherry uh, earthiness, uh, and the color was was a wasn't a really really deep color um, was was somewhat see through, and I got that accordion case like flavor out of it, which right there screams uh, screams Italy, but I wasn't too sure. Okay. Um, my initial conclusion was that I was either in a Southern Rhone, so I thought I might have been drinking a Grenache or a Syrah, um, or or Northern Italian. Okay, and the accordion case was the was was what really was pushed me into that was really pushed me into that. So let's let's talk about uh, so that that's so that's the setup. Okay, so now let's uh, let's kind of talk about uh, Tuscan wine. Right. They've been making wine in Tuscany since the 8th century BC. Um, it is the fifth largest region in Italy, uh, as far as geographically, and it's the third largest in production. Um, depending on what website you're looking at or who, what the law was today, um, there's either 42 or 39 DOCs. Now that's uh, Demozione Originale Control or whatever. It's you know it's a it's a it's a specific wine area um, in Italy. Uh, it's called the DOC. So it's, it's called the an AOC in France. It's called a DO in uh, Spain. So it's just a, it's like an appellation in the United States. Um, there's 11 DOCGs. Now these are uh, the G is Geographica. Okay, this just means a more specific area. So that's like going from Texas. Well, okay, that's like going 
from uh, let's say Napa Valley to a more to a to a to a smaller sub Appalachian. That's that's not not a state to a to a it's not a state to a like hill country, but going within a, within an Appalachian to a smaller sub Appalachian. Okay, so in this case, Toscana going into Chianti. Okay, so that's what a DOCG is. Uh, Chianti. So Chianti is one of the most famous well-known regions uh, of wine in, in Italy. Uh, they, they've had different ways to make a Chianti. So a lot of people think Chianti is the grape, and it's not. Um, it's, it's a style of wine. It's, it's an area of Italy that, that makes wine. And they've had quite a few recipes over the years. Um, Bettino uh, Ricasole is considered the father of modern Chianti. Um, he traveled through France and Germany uh, to look look at what how they made wines, look at the grapes they use, brought some of those back to, to try to use those. Um, he also created the Chianti recipe. So this is um, this is what he created or what he decided Chianti should be. 70% Sangiovese. Now that is the grape of Tuscany. Um, that is what all Chiantis have got to have. So it's not the Chianti grape, it's Sangiovese. Uh, 15% Can- Caneolo, uh, 10% Malvasia, uh, it's also, uh, they also allow Trebbiano, which, uh, these are white wines or white, white varietals and then 5% other local red varieties. So you've got those, those grapes that they only grow in Tuscany that nobody can remember the name of, you know, where they've got a million names and even though it's a small area. All right, Chianti now. So back when, when they were messing with these, uh, formulas or these recipes, um, the Tuscany area got hit with two, uh, two um, uh, scourges, let's put it that way. Uh, odium, which is this powdery mildew type of thing. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fungus that, that grows and it, it kills off, it can kill off the vine. Uh, then you have phylloxera, that's a louse that really eats the roots. So both of these are things that are just not good to have on your vines because you don't have any great production. Um, in the 20th century, so that, that hurt, that hurt first. Then in the 20th century, um, the quality of these wines really started suffering. Um, you know, you had a couple wars, you know, that, that kind of can hurt quality of wine. Uh, after World War II, Chianti became known as like that really cheap wine. You know, those, 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 uh, straw flasks, the fiascos, um, you know, has literally a fiasco of a wine, um, the, the, you know, those became like the stereotypical, you know, uh, wine from Italy, the, the, the kind of the big bulb. And then of course in the Italian restaurants, they stick the candle in there and that was your candle on the table, right? Um, let me make sure that this is still attached. Okay. Um, so that, so it became kind of known as a cheap wine. In 1996, uh, they started making modifications to the DOC laws in Italy, DOC and DSOGs. Um, they they have uh, they they created eight subzones, uh, plus you have Classico, Superiore, and Normale. Um, Classico is what is considered the kind of original area of Chianti. It's kind of the central core part of it. Superiore is just a higher um, is just a higher alcohol version, kind of like uh, Superior in Bordeaux, and Normale is just normal. Okay, uh, then they created a new recipe. So this one, you can have anywhere from 75% up to 100% Sangiovese. So this is when they allowed Chianti to be 100% Sangiovese. Up until then, you had to have something else in there. Uh, You can have up to 10% Caneolo and 20% of any other approved red variety. Uh, In 2006, they uh, banned the use of white varieties in Classico. So you couldn't be using Trebbiano and Malvasia. Uh, Super Tuscans. Now, these were created in response to uh, just bad Chianti wine being made. And you had these winemakers that really wanted to make good wine, but the Chiantis that were being made, they weren't very good. And the DOC rules, the regulations, um, were too restrictive. So this is something we have to remember with with, uh, wines. Old world wines, pretty much you can only grow grapes or only make wines from specific grapes. They decided a long time ago that these are the grapes that grow well in these areas. And when you buy a wine from that area, you don't need to 
necessarily put the grapes on the label because you know that only those grapes grow in that area. Um, unlike the new world where it's anything goes, you can have, I don't know, you can have Zweigelt growing in Minnesota. Okay, I just like to say the name Zweigelt and it's just an obscure name. But you know, this, that's an Austrian grape. You know, you can, you can grow it anywhere in the United States and grow it in Napa Valley for all I care. And you have a Napa Valley Zweigelt. Who's to tell you you can't grow it there, you know? Who's to say I can't have, you know, some weird grape varietal growing, you know, in, in Texas? So there's no correlation between area and grape in the New World, especially in the United States, okay? Um, so they created, these, uh, they created these wines out of frustration. So these wines were considered uh, officially an IGT. That's Indicazione Geografica Typica. Uh, so, you know, an in, in indication of a, of a typical geographic area. Uh, there's no rules on what grape varieties they can use. They can use whatever they want. They can use Bordeaux varietals. They can, they can sit there and, and get uh, Tempranillo from Spain. They can use Garnacha or Grenache. They can, they can use Riesling. You know, they do whatever they want. Okay, and it's all it's all in Italy, not just in Tuscany. Uh, the first one that did this, uh, well, the first one was in 1978, as far as being released. And it was in 1971, uh, Tignolo. Um, the Super Tuscan started becoming known for higher quality. Um, and what the one that really put Super Tuscans on the map was Sasakaya, and that was from Tenuta Sanguido. Um, so that winemaker really is the one that, while he wasn't the first, he was the one that really said, man, I got a kick-ass wine, we're going to put it out, and it's not going to be called a Chianti because... Um, I, I don't follow the rules. Uh, it was a Bordeaux blend. So you're using all the Bordeaux varieties. That's like you know, having a Meritage from California. Um, and it's one of the most successful Super Tuscans. It's one of the most uh, well-known Super Tuscans out there. Um, so, so that's like the brief, you know, what, what's the difference between a, a Chianti and a Super Tuscan. So what was the final result, uh, final conclusion of the wine I had at Max's? Um, well, I was like, old world, Italy, Sangiovese, Chianti, and I said it was a 2006 or 2007 vintage. So I basically said it was a three to five year. Yes. No. I said it was a older wine. See, three to five, five would be 2007. So I was at the break point between older and, and, and five years. So I said 2006, 2007. And then the result um, was it. I think what it was, I don't remember which year it was, but it was a 2006 or 2007 Castello Vicchio Maggio Villa Valle Maggiore. Valle Maggiore. See, I, 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 I had worked on this before. Okay, Castello Vicchio Maggio Villa Valle Maggiore Campostella. How's that? I actually pronounced it pretty much right. It is not a Chianti. It is from Tuscany. It's a Toscana IGT from the Mare Ma. Uh, part of, of Tuscany. Now this is kind of in the southern western part of Tuscany. Um, it's the Grosseto region of Toscana and it's kind of near the coast. So um, while I was technically, while I didn't get the wine right, technically if I was going to do the certified sommelier exam, I would have been correct from all the conclusions on how I would have been talking about it. And I, it's technically the right wine. It just was not a Chianti. Uh, and it could be a Chianti, um, but it's not. It's, it's an IGT. So that was the result. So that was one of those times where I was like, yes, on the, on the uh, blind tasting. Uh, you know, there's plenty of times I'm kind of like, ugh, I can't believe I missed it. So that's going to do it for uh, Tuscany uh, or Super Tuscan versus Chianti. It was a really brief overview. Uh, was pretty simple, but it was just to give you an idea that Chianti is a Sangiovese-based wine, and they have to stick to a certain formula. Um, and they can only have certain percentages. They can have 100% Sangiovese, but um, as far as the other grapes they want to use in there, they have to be very restrictive of what they do. Uh, we didn't go through all. There's a bunch of different uh, sub appellations of Chianti besides just the Classico and all the differences between that. But I just want to give you an idea what Super Tuscan versus a, um, a Chianti was. So you understood a Super Tuscan is just from the same area. It just It's whatever, anything goes as far as making the wine. 
All right, so that's going to do it for today's show. I really want to thank all of you for stopping by, checking it out. Uh, as always, stop by the website. Click the links up above to friend me up or hit, hit the social media aspects. Click the links below for uh, the wineries uh, that I mentioned. Well, the wine, the Sonoma, because cul-de-sac's not going to have a, a thing. But the products I uh, talked about on the, on the show, you can click those links. Hit the donate button over here for PayPal. Send me, send me a couple ducats my way. And uh, we'll see everyone again next time.